Welcome everyone for our panel discussion held in conjunction with the screening of First Vote. We have an exciting and timely conversation to provide a perspective from the Asian electorate and what are the top priorities weighing on their minds heading into this election. You know, the 2020 elections, 5% of the nation's eligible voters are Asian. That equates to over 11 million Asians who are eligible to vote. Now, they are also the only racial or ethnic group in which naturalized citizens rather than the US born make up a majority of eligible voters. It's been exciting to see because in 2018, voter turnout increased among non-Hispanic Asians by over 49%. And we saw Asian American um, young voters from 18 to 34 double their participation rate. At this time, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the conversation over to jo Janelle Wong to talk about the recent findings from the 2020 Asian American Voter Survey sponsored by API Vote, API Data, and Asian American Advancing Justice AJC. Thank you, Christine. So I'm really excited to both be part of this panel and to say a little bit more about the 2020 Asian American Voter Survey. That was a survey that was conducted from July through September of 2020 and with a collaboration of different organizations. We actually surveyed uh, almost 1,600 Asian American registered voters, and we did that in language. So we have a great sense of where Asian American voters are today. What we're seeing from that survey is we see very high enthusiasm across the Asian American electorate. So compared to previous elections, 54% of Asian American registered voters say they're more enthusiastic to get involved and vote this year. At the same time, we see that almost half of those registered voters have not been contacted by either political party. And so there's room to fire up our community and get us out to the polls. This is really important because key issues driving the Asian American electorate this year include jobs in the economy, healthcare, and education. So that looks a lot like other Americans, but where do Asian Americans look distinct from other voters? They're actually more progressive on a range of issues. Those issues include healthcare. So Asian Americans are healthcare voters. They want to see an expansion of healthcare and more access to healthcare. That includes gun control. Asian Americans are more likely to support stricter gun control measures than other Americans. That includes the environment. Asian Americans are environmentalists and we see extremely high levels of enthusiasm for stronger efforts by the federal government to address climate change and global warming. And finally, racism. Asian Americans are deeply invested in racial justice and we see that throughout our survey findings, whether it's towards police reforms or addressing anti-Asian bias in the wake of COVID. Well, Janelle, you know, to follow up, um, you know, a lot of folks are always asking, the community is so diverse. So are there any particular trends that you're seeing among the different ethnic communities? Yeah, I mean, I think we can answer that in both ways. On the one hand, we see that there is a lot of diversity in the community. And so one of the things we do in this survey is to disaggregate the data so that we can look at different Asian American national origin groups. We can also look at these data across age group and generation. And so we see some interesting divergences within the Asian American community. For instance, most Asian Americans in our community seem to be supporting the Democratic candidate, Joe Biden over Trump, but Vietnamese Americans who tend to be more Republican are supporting Donald Trump over uh, Joe Biden. We do see a lot of undecideds across the community. So again, there's room for mobilization. At the same time, we also see that there's a generational gap in the Asian American community. So we see that younger Asian American voters who are 18 to 34 tend to be more progressive than older Asian American voters. Keeping in mind that across the community, including Asian American voters, there tends to be more uh, a, a lot more racial uh, progressivism than the, the general population. So we have both things going on. We have these progressive elements in our community. The older generation tends to be a little bit more conservative, but at the same time, that older generation is still more progressive than let's say white Americans. And then finally, despite all this diversity, I just think it's really important and really significant that we do see some convergences politically. So we're starting to see like, 
astronomical uh, numbers in terms of support for universal health care, gun control, the environment, and issues that I think have to do with a strong social safety net for all of our communities. And then do you see any, um, as a result, because of how they stand on the issues, how does that translate in terms of party identification? Yeah, so over the last uh, few decades, we've seen Asian Americans move most rapidly and most dramatically towards the Democrats over time. And that's compared to other racial groups. That's partly because Asian Americans were more split than either Black Americans or Latinx Americans. In 1992, I would say that the community was split when it came to partisanship with a lot of people who were undecided. Today, we see that most Asian Americans are Democrats, they identify as Democrats. And this is one of the surveys that we see, the Asian American Voter Survey of 2020. We see that there are actually more people identifying as Democrats than as undecided. And that's kind of a change. We've always had a lot of undecided voters in our ranks and we're starting to see a little bit of a shift. At the same time, we see that there are a core group of Republicans. So there are still uh, over 20%, I would say, in some communities are Republican. Among some, among groups like Vietnamese, we see even higher numbers. And that accounts for the fact that Donald Trump continues to have some support among Asian Americans, very consistent support across election cycles, uh, the 2016 versus today. So knowing these results, I want to go ahead and go to our grassroots organizations in Ohio and North Carolina. So we have Elaine with Asia and uh, Chavi from North Carolina. Um, what I want to know is what are you observing and hearing and what are, how are your organizations organizing for the elections? Hi, thanks, Christine. Elaine Sao here from Asian Services in Action. We've been mobilizing uh, a very grassroots effort uh, by going to grocery stores that still remain open during this pandemic. And we've had uh, culturally uh, and linguistically focused team members out talking to the community members and getting them registered to vote. Something that we've seen is uh, just a, a much greater motivation to get registered to vote. You know, yesterday I was out at a uh, ethnic grocery store and there were, there were people going in and out of the grocery store. And when they saw us outside of the grocery store, they, they said, what is going on here? And, you know, we told them that we were registering folks to vote and um, they said, oh, I need to get, get registered to vote. And so uh, there's definitely a much greater motivation for this uh, election than in years past. Now, are you hearing like what type of reasons they're giving for their motivation? I think that they are recognizing that um, they need to vote for an individual that is focused on the people and you know someone who is going to uh, fight for and stand up for um, individuals um, in this country. And um, I think that that's what's strongly motivating them. And then uh, Chavi, what's happening in North Carolina? Yeah, so um, I'm based in Raleigh, which um, has one of the biggest API populations in North Carolina. Um, and similar to Elaine, we had a voter registration event outside of a um, grocery store this past weekend and experienced the same thing. It was the first in-person event that we've had in months. Um, and I was personally afraid that people would run and hide. Like, why are you asking me to do anything in person? Um, but there was, they were really receptive. Um, in North Carolina, we have our citizen age voting population um, is pretty largely made up of um, youth. So it's like about 30% are youth um, and a whole bunch are aging into the electorate this year. So we've been um, putting a lot of focus on continuing our art outreach on campuses, even while we're remote, um, working with professors to have voter registration at the beginning of their virtual Zoom webinars and lectures. Um, and then also working a lot um, on the multilingual uh, population. Um, the one thing I was just going to add was that we're also seeing a huge um, change since 2016 in, in voter motivation. And 
particularly with that middle age population that it's always harder to engage. Um, and I think at least in North Carolina, there has been a lot of um, discrimination and racism that's come out uh, because of the pandemic um, and because of uh, the president using terms like the China virus. Um, and I think just the handling of the pandemic in general, we have a democratic governor and a Republican president and kind of seeing the differences in how that's handled and there's strong opinions on both sides but um i think that's what's led to a lot of motivation in our state at least you know seeing that you guys are coming from states where it's highly divided and you know we have families where it's um intergener intergenerational conversations are being had because during this pandemic people younger generations are um, staying at home so how do families talk about differences in politics? Are there any best practices that you've seen and that you guys are practicing? You know, in 2016, the conversation around voting and, you know, the issues um, that, uh, as, you know, being, being decided were more along the lines of, you know, may, you know the people in, in, in families would say that, they weren't sure if uh, their vote mattered and um, they, they felt unheard. And for this general election, it's a very different conversation. Uh, I think that um, more families are engaging in, in conversation about, you know, we definitely need to participate this particular year because, you know, perhaps they did not participate in 2016 and, uh, you know, their voice wasn't, definitely wasn't heard because they didn't vote. And um, so this year, I think that families are having that difficult conversation and encouraging each other to participate. During this period of the pandemic, we've also seen um, the uprising and just so many different issues. Um, and I think what we've noticed is that that's really what's caused the, like the conversations have, have been a lot based on what people are experiencing and so i think that's opened the door to conversations that were harder to have in 2016 and 2018. um chavi in north carolina i've i've noticed that there's an increasing number of asian americans running for office so how has that translated in terms of motivation and, and turning out of the asian american electorate and then are the parties doing any better in terms of outreaching to your community yeah, I'm glad you said that because I lost my train of thought when I was talking just a moment ago. Because the other thing I was going to say related to that, so we have three APIs who are currently running for office in 2020, two for state senate um, and one for state treasurer. Um, and, you know, these are the first for most of these offices. Um, so that makes a difference. Uh, but I think also just we have so many important races on the North Carolina ballot this year. And so being able to talk about what people in each of these positions do um, has been like fodder for a lot of conversation as well. Um, I, I can't say that the parties have done all that much better, probably a little better than 2016, but um, you know, at least there's like an acknowledgement and I think having API candidates um, definitely helps parties reach out a little bit more, especially when they're trying to get that vote from particular districts, um, which both of our uh, state Senate candidates are coming from districts that are heavily, heavily API. So. And Janelle, can you remind us uh, once again, like what the survey data is showing? And also, has there been any changes throughout the years about um, outreach from the parties? Yeah, the survey data are showing that most Asian Americans, just about half of all Asian Americans have not received any contact at all from the two major parties uh, at the same time that they are demonstrating a high level of enthusiasm, just as Chavi and Elaine have made clear. So I think, you know, we're seeing this, this real opportunity to get out the vote, especially in these swing states of Ohio and North Carolina. And it's all along the whole time that I've been doing these surveys over the last 20 years, we've seen very low levels of mobilization directed at Asian Americans. So this could be a turning point as we come into this 
election if we see more attention to these uh, important populations. Elaine, I also want to focus once again to first time voters, right? So it could be if it's a typical election year for first time voters, it's still very daunting to understand where your options in terms of voting. Um, what are you seeing in Ohio? Are they uh, making it easier to vote? Are there certain barriers that you have to consider? What are your observations? We have been very engaged with um, first time voters. Uh, last year, there was a, a crop of uh, newly uh, uh, naturalized citizens and they're voting for the first time uh, in this general election. The state of Ohio has um, uh, a couple of options to uh, vote this year. You can, we can still vote in person. We can vote by mail. And um, you know, one of the challenges that we had some advocacy around, unfortunately, it was unsuccessful. But um, we were hoping to uh, have the Secretary of State use some of its funding to pay for postage stamps to obtain absentee ballots for uh, this year's uh, election to vote by mail. Unfortunately, uh, the controlling board, which um, is the board that authorizes the budget, would not permit the Secretary of State to use some of its um, funding to pay for postage stamps, to pay for the, um, the postage to obtain the absentee ballot. I mean, I, you know, for many of the community members, it is a barrier, you know, to if they're working full time or if they work hours that do not um, allow them to, you know, make a separate trip to get a postage stamp, that in and of itself uh, can be a barrier to voting. And, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, now the time is, is, uh, is too short to change that decision from the uh, Ohio Controlling Board. But um, we're doing our best to inform the community that, you know, they can drop off their uh, absentee ballot at the um, boards of elections in their county. Um, they can vote by mail uh, after they get their, their ballot in the mail, or they can vote in person. It's always fascinating to hear what is happening in each of the states, because I know the laws and regulations vary from state to state. Um, so with that, Jerry, I want to go ahead and get your thoughts, especially um, since we just experienced the passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You know, what are some of your thoughts in terms of that impact on the Asian American and Pacific Islander community? And I want to talk a little bit more about um, what are some of the barriers that we may be facing in this election cycle? Yeah, so there's a lot of issues going on. Uh, with the passing of the justice, we all know that one of the, the issues that are front and center is uh, you know, women's reproductive rights. And um, we, we've conducted a Asian American survey um, for several decades. And one of the questions that we ask on this, this exit poll survey is about women's reproductive rights. And we see a majority of uh, Asian Americans across uh, different ethnic groups, uh, there's wide support for women's reproductive rights uh, within the Asian American community. So that may be an opportunity for um, people in the community to come out on an issue that they think is important. Um, now, that being said, even if uh, the uh, election outcomes uh, result in the president not being reelected and the power in the Senate being shifted, there still is a possibility that um, a, nominee, a nominee could go through, but we'll see if that happens. Uh, there's also the, the issue of whether that's going to energize um, other voters um, uh, in other places. Along, you know, with COVID, what we've seen also is a lot of the groups that we work with do voter registration drives, especially in a presidential election year. One of the things that we do we are waiting outside the courtroom at the federal courthouse right after uh, citizens, new citizens take their oath and become a US citizen. As soon as they exit that courtroom, we are out there with voter registration forms. It's a really great experience. People come running over. It's the first thing they can do as a US citizen. They're really excited to register to vote. Well, that hasn't been happening for the last few months. I mean, we're, and this is happening all around the country. So um, in terms of voter registration, we're really back um, behind where we usually are in a, in a presidential election year. Um, and, you know, with COVID also, 
a lot of these updates that are being um, uh, published on, on websites, sent, in, sent out in mailers, many Asian Americans are limited to English proficient and they need language assistance. So when you're giving them information uh, related to COVID and absentee ballots and absentee ballot applications, um, certain jurisdictions under the Voting Rights Act are required to provide Asian language assistance. There's 27 counties um, across the country required to provide Asian language assistance. Well, not all of them are doing that. Um, there hasn't been a single case brought by this Department of Justice uh, under the Voting Rights Act protect minority rights. Uh, the one case that they were involved in in Texas, the voter ID law, they actually reversed their position. So um, there's no help from the Department of Justice Certain jurisdictions are not complying with their obligations. Uh, so our backs are really up against the wall. I know that certain states are purging lists. And so I know um, some of the messaging is that we're trying to um, educate voters that even if you believe that you are registered and you voted in the past, that you do check your registration. But Jerry, what happens if you show up at the polls and they say that your name is not on the list? What, what can you do? What are your rights? Call LDEF <laughs> or call, uh, you know, lawyers committee. Um, we have the, the numbers there, but you should know this. When you go in to a poll site, if you believe you're a, regist a duly registered voter, especially if you voted there before, under the Help America Vote Act, HAVA, they, the poll workers, they must provide you with a provisional ballot. Uh, some states, they refer to it as an affidavit ballot. So either way, whether it's a provisional ballot or an affidavit ballot, you have that right as a voter to demand that ballot. Um, you won't be voting like everybody else, okay? This is your emergency backup. They say your name's not on the voter roll. Um, you demand this ballot and you're gonna vote differently than everybody else. You're gonna have to fill out that paper ballot, make sure you complete it and make sure it's accurate. And then you are signing that ballot, you're signing the there's an envelope it has to go into, that has to be signed. If there's any problem with the ballot or the envelope, they're gonna discard your vote, okay? Um, they seal that envelope and after election day, they're gonna to check to see if you are in fact a duly registered voter. If you are, uh, your vote will count. Uh, if not, it's not gonna count, right? But uh, this is better than turning around and not voting, right? So and that's, your, that's your backup. You, you have that right. They have to give you that provisional ballot or affidavit ballot. Should also mention, you can come with somebody. If you are limited English proficient, you can't see the ballot. If you cannot mark the ballot or if you cannot read the ballot, okay, you are allowed to bring any person of your choice inside that voting booth with you as long as it's not your employer or union rep. And so many Asian Americans uh, that are limited English proficient they will bring their minor children or grandchildren. Uh, could be anybody, just can't be your boss or union rep. Um, and there's no limit in, in most states. Uh, you can, the person that's assisting the voter can assist multiple people, right? So these are some really big rights that you have and um, it's, it's best to be informed when you go uh, to the poll. If you decide to vote, whether it's early voting, if your state has it, you know, use it please, if you feel comfortable. Uh, go with the person, even if there's social distancing, they have to allow you to bring that person with you if you need them to assist you in voting. Um, and when you're, if you decide to vote by mail, by absentee ballot, be very, very careful. There are, you know, the, the, the rules vary depending on jurisdiction, on whether, uh, you know, whether they accept your ballot, uh, how they can invalidate your ballot, uh, whether they need to notify you if there's a, a, a problem, whether there's an opportunity for you to cure any problem, there's a lot of things that go into it. And, um, you know, I'd encourage you to look at most of our organizations. We have uh, materials out there uh, that you can use as a resource to understand what the rules are. Yes, I would encourage everyone to call ALDEF as well as API Vote and Advancing Justice also has a hotline of 888-API-VOTE. Um, also, one last thing, just very quickly, Jerry. Um, you know, the deadline for the census is coming up and, you know, the data collected on our community really impacts the redistricting um, process. Can you explain the importance of that and what is what is redistricting? So redistricting is when they, they redraw 
the legislative districts every 10 years because people are moving and shifting. So we're, we're collecting that data on the movements and shifts in the census. Then we're using that official census data uh, to redraw all of the legislative districts. Now I'm talking about state assembly, state senate, congressional districts, city council districts, your school board, all of these different legislative levels. Um, they're happening at different timelines, um, but they all, most of them are starting in uh, the spring of 2021 after we have official um, census data. And traditionally what we've seen is that if you have a center, a population of Asian Americans, what we call a community of common interest, so many times the reason the community cannot elect a candidate of their choice, we're just talking about North Carolina and other places where all these people are starting to run, you really see the impact of redistricting when somebody for the first time is running from the community, everybody comes out to vote for that person and that person still can't win. And when you look at the district lines, you can then see, oh, our community, which is whole and centered in this one area, there are three or four different districts that are dividing up our community. Um, and that is the harm of redistricting. It is not a coincidence that this, is, this happens to communities of color all over the country, right? And the Voting Rights Act has protections to protect our community. And sorry, I know you said to be quick, but uh, it takes a second to explain that. that. But I do wanna say this, traditionally our communities have been small and we haven't been able to use all the protections of the Voting Rights Act. This census, this cycle, uh, and this redistricting cycle, for the first time, I think we're gonna have the ability to bring affirmative litigation under the Voting Rights Act to require uh, the map drawers to, to draw a Asian majority district. When you can draw an Asian majority district, that's when you are on equal footing with other communities, and that's when we see people from our community being elected to office. It really is one of the most important uh, aspects of civic engagement and political participation, and it lasts for 10 years. We need everybody on board on this. And this is the last question for everyone. Um, can you go ahead and provide one action item that everyone um, that's watching this can take um, for this election cycle? I think the biggest action item people can take is really to register now and even after the election, keep registration efforts going. I think we pay a lot of attention to registration in the days before an election, but for our community, year round registration, registration in the years between uh, major elections is also really, really critical. Encourage every person in our network, in our sphere of influence, to uh, go out and vote um, on election day and uh, do everything possible in preparation for, for voting ahead of the election. So we've, we've started this thing since uh, the pandemic began um, called TAP3. And what that means is if you're registered, tap three others, reach out to three others to make sure they're registered to vote. If you've made a voting day plan, reach out to three others. If you filled out the census, and that's the way we're gonna spread the word through our community. And also, if you're in North Carolina and wanna vote by mail, please check out our website, um, ncaat.vote, um, because the rules are complicated and we're already seeing a lot of rejections. You have to take election day off. Election day, take the day off and uh, volunteer with one of our organizations. Um, you could multi volunteer for multiple organizations or even a campaign, but you have to do something on election day. Make sure you're voting, your friends are voting, your family, family is, is able to vote. Uh, now is the time you check your registration and come up with a plan. How are we gonna do this? Are we voting by mail? Are we going during early voting if we have it? Um, if we are doing absentee ballot, do we need an excuse? Is COVID a valid excuse? We have to look at these things now, right? Um, or are we gonna go on election day? Right. Um, so we need that plan and keep in mind that voting, this is not something that we do every four years or every two years. You have elections every year, every year. Um, and we have to sort of drill that into our community. Um, this is something that we do every single year, every November uh, and possibly other times. Thank you, Jerry. And thank you everyone for tuning in today with this conversation. 
Um, we are looking forward to having you activate your friends and family. Um, we are asking you to take action as recommended by all of us. And it really is in your hands. We know uh, based on the data from 2016 that you might as well assume that half of your family and friends are not registered and voting. So it's really up to you to start those conversations, but don't end with it just being a conversation, but do whatever you can to make sure that each and every one of them uh, take action to be able to cast their ballots. So thank you very much for this conversation and we look forward to seeing you at the polls.